to take our possessions and flee. I'm very good at that. I was the men's freestyle fleeing champion two years in a row. No, it's not the answer. It's an answer, and it's the wrong answer. The correct answer is flee. F-L-E-A. Flee. A conscientious objector is an individual who has claimed the right to refuse to perform military service on the grounds of freedom of thought, conscience, and or religion. Such an objection is usually the refusal to collaborate with military organizations as a combatant in war or in any supportive role. Due to the horrendous casualties on the Western Front in World War I, Great Britain chose to introduce conscription with the Military Service Act of March 1916. In the 1700s, following problems trying to force Quakers to serve in the army, the United Kingdom recognized the right of individuals not to fight. The Militia Ballot Act of 1757 allowed Quakers to be excluded from service in the militia. It then ceased to be a major issue, since Britain's armed forces were generally all volunteer. This act included the right to refuse military service. It allowed for objectors to be absolutely exempted to perform alternative civilian service or to serve as a non-combatant in the Army's non-combatant corps, according to the extent to which they could convince a military service tribunal of the quality of their objection. From March 1916, military service was compulsory for all single men in England, Scotland, and Wales aged 18 to 41, except those who were in jobs essential to the war effort, the sole support of dependents, medically unfit, or those who could show a conscientious objection. Further military service laws included married men, tightened occupational exemptions, and raised the age limit up to 50. Approximately 16,000 British men were objectors to armed service during the First World War. The main reasons why men objected to armed service during the First World War were Morality, a belief that killing another man was not acceptable under any circumstances. Religion, Pacifism was a core belief of some Christians. Politics. Some believed that the ruling classes were making a war that the workers had to fight. There was a lot of contention about this politically. However, some of those opposed to this war weren't necessarily against fighting all wars, and they reserved the right to fight for a cause in which they believed. Humanism. Humanists felt it was wrong to kill, but not on religious grounds. Objection to government intervention. Some thought the war had nothing to do with them personally, but might have fought if they had felt the United Kingdom was directly threatened. Lord Kitchener's campaign had encouraged over one million men to enlist by January 1915, but this was not enough to keep pace with the mounting casualties. British conscription in January 1916 pulled many away from most occupations, including farmers and shopkeepers across society into army ranks. Secretary of State for War Winston Churchill said that the members of the NCC must be regarded as soldiers and not as conscientious objectors, as it was entirely composed of men whose conscience permits them to serve as British soldiers, though it does not permit them to take human life. Soldiers here are conducting a mock trial for an objector. Many soldiers in much of British society felt that it was unfair that they had to put their lives on the line in the trenches while the NCC worked behind the lines in relative safety. This is a suggested coat of arms for the NCC by a sergeant major who was serving in France at the time. Their duties were mainly to provide physical labor such as building, cleaning, loading, and unloading, anything except munitions in support of the military. Any absolutist who objected to wearing a uniform were formally charged and court-martialed. The NCC was seen as effeminate and unmanly by society, as these period cartoons show. Objectors were army privates, wore army uniforms, and were subject to army discipline, but didn't carry weapons nor take part in battle. The NCC received lesser pay than most other soldiers and were generally held in lower esteem. The Corps was disparagingly referred to as the No Courage Corps and the Pick and Shovel Brigade by the British press. Even though the objectors of the NCC did not carry arms, they still were in danger at times and were killed while serving, though not always by enemy fire, as the next two examples show. 
The earliest death recorded is that of Private Duncan MacDonald of the First Scottish Company, who died on June 4, 1916, when a train killed him about a mile north of Marquis, France. Although there were no direct witnesses, it was probably not a suicide, but MacDonald may have not been familiar with trains and the dangers of walking on the rail lines at night. The next death is that of Private John Oliver Thomas of First Western Company, NCC, who died, aged 32, on September 18, 1917. He had been exempted on March 9, 1916, and married shortly before he went to France with his unit. His death was the result of an accident. When working as a shunter on a railway moving earth at Inchville with the 313th Road Construction Company of the Royal Engineers, he fell and was crushed beneath the locomotive, suffering horrible injuries. Thomas was taken to Canadian General Hospital No. 2, where he underwent emergency surgery, but survived only six days after the accident. Often they were bullied, deprived of basic needs and rights, and imprisoned. The men who refused to perform duties like handling munitions or building rifle ranges were harshly dealt with. Some broke down, physically or mentally, as a result of their ill treatment. The Corps was refused the January 1919 Army pay increase and denied any final gratuity. The NCC was demobilized more slowly than the combatants, and it wasn't finally disbanded until January 1920. This is a pacifist memorial in London stating, to all those who have established and are maintaining the right to refuse to kill. President John F. Kennedy, himself a World War II veteran, stated, War will exist until that distant day when the conscientious objector enjoys the same reputation and prestige that the warrior does today. It was a pleasure to make this video. If you like this video, then check out two of my other videos on D-Day, What Would Sun Tzu Do? and Should the Continentals Have Retreated from Charlestown in 1780? Thank you for watching.